Welcome everyone to the forum on the 2020 National Indigenous Languages Report. I'm Carmel O'Shaughnessy from ANU and I'd first like to welcome Casey Millward. Casey, if you're here, Director of the Indigenous Culture and Policy Team at IATSIS. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would firstly like to start by acknowledging the land on which we are meeting today, the Ngunnawal people. And I'm not sure, but I assume we have people from all across the country joining us. So I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal elders, past and present, and um, elders uh, from across the country whose land we are meeting on today. Um, firstly, I'd just like to introduce myself. Um, as Carmel said, my name's Casey Millward. I'm a Kalkadoon woman um, from Northwest Queensland and I grew up on Bindle and Wagarukaba country in Townsville. And I moved and have been living on Ngunnawal country um, for about the last 10 years. Um, I'm the director of the Indigenous Culture and Policy team at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to include the IATSIS language um, preservation and reawakening and strengthening um, as part of my team's portfolio. Uh, in February, I was also fortunate enough to be part of the delegation from IATSIS, led by our CEO, Craig Ritchie, along with Dr. Doug Marmion, who you'll be hearing from soon, to visit Mexico City for the International Congress of Languages at Risk and the UNESCO High Level Event towards the International Decade on Indigenous Languages after the very successful year uh, of the um, United Nations Indigenous uh, National Year of Indigenous Languages in 2019. A key output from the trip was the signing of the Los Pinos Declaration, which recognises that reawakening Indigenous language is a core aspect of cultural resurgence and identity. And the benefits of speaking your mother tongue include positive economic and social outcomes across health, well-being, education and employment. Um, as you would know, the refresh closing the gap targets for the first time uh, include a language target. Target 16, which is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and languages are strong, supported and flourishing. And by 2031, there will be a sustained increase in the number and strength of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages being spoken. This is a very important signal from Indigenous peoples and communities given the uh, input they had into the refresh of the Closing the Gap target about the importance that they place on language. Uh, currently work is being done with um, the National Indigenous Australians Agency, Office for the Arts, NIATSIS to define and expand what those language targets mean in practical terms and how we will get there. Uh, language plays a vital role in policy for justice, education, socioeconomic benefits and the list goes on. Being able to access and understand information from your own language is crucial. Uh, the Disability Royal Commission actually contacted IATSIS not long ago to better understand some of the information um, from the report um, and being able to use Indigenous language. So when people are um, giving witness or providing information, they'll be able to do that in their language. Um, uh, to ensure also that the outcomes of the Royal Commission are easily understood by people being able to read that in their first language. So uh, I would like to commend them on that work and I really hope that it's the start of further commissions and further governments doing work in this area, uh, not just by using translation services, but by actually um, reporting and um, in, in first languages. Um, so with that said, I won't I'll hold you up too much longer. So um, thank you. And I'll just hand back to Carmen to start proceedings. Thank you very much, Casey. This forum has three parts. In the first part, we'll hear about the National Indigenous Languages or NILA report. We'll have a short break and then hear presentations on the ramifications of the report. After another short break, we'll break into small discussion groups. The National Indigenous Languages Report was commissioned by the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communication Office for the Arts, and Justine Curnow from that office will speak with us today. 
The report is a result of a partnership between the Department, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS, and the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Languages and School of Literature, Languages and Linguistics at ANU. The report and today's discussion have three main parts. First, a survey of languages being spoken and renewed by IATSIS called MILS 3. Second, research about how an understanding of language ecologies, that is, which languages are spoken in a specific place and by whom and when can inform policy and service delivery. And third, how speaking and knowing Indigenous languages leads to increased wellbeing outcome. We'll now hear from Dr. Doug Marmion from IATSIS about the first part of the report, the National Indigenous Languages Survey. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Carmel. And uh, I'll, I'd just like to start by uh, sharing my screen. I hope this works all right. Uh, right, so I think, uh, does that appear to be working for everyone, Carmel? That's good, thank you, Doug. Great, okay, thanks very much So for that. So uh, now, so I'm uh, Doug Marmin, I'm the Research Fellow in Linguistics at IAPSIS, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the uh, NILS 3, that is the National Indigenous Languages Survey. So uh, the, I hope this isn't confusing that there's a NILA, uh, National Indigenous Languages Report, and also a NILS, a survey. Now, the, the National Indigenous Languages Survey, or NILS for short, was carried out by a team at IATSIS and it forms one of the key components of the, uh, the NILA, the report. This NILS is actually the third National Indigenous Languages Survey carried out by IATSIS, following on from the first NILS in 2005 and the second NILS, which was carried out in 2014. So, uh, three so far, a lot of work there. Now, this uh, third NILS, sought to answer the question, what is the current state of Indigenous languages in Australia? Now, it, it, it aimed to create a snapshot of the current status of Australian languages with a focus on the numbers of speakers, the age and gender distributions of speakers, and how languages are used. The survey methodology used a uh, two-pronged approach targeted at two groups. Now, the main focus was on language centres and uh, and other Indigenous communities or organisations that carry out language projects. And I'll, I'll show you now a, uh, an image to see, so you can get an idea of where the language centres are. So this is a map from the Indigenous Languages and Arts uh, website showing the, uh, langu the language centres across Australia and how they're distributed. Uh, a key... You're not in slide so, sli slideshow mode. Do you want to go into slideshow mode? Ah, yes. Sorry, what do I have to do? If, if that's not already. If it's, I think you just have to share the other screen, Doug, because you're sharing the presenter screen. I see. Okay. There we go. Right. So uh, I'll stop sharing. Oh, that's oh. annoying. And I'll start again. Uh, I'm not sure if this. I'm sorry. I'm. We don't have much time, so I might just. That's go. okay. The same one would have, would be fine. Yeah. I'll I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. That's so, the one there. Okay, thanks very much. My apologies, everyone. So there's the uh, map showing the locations of language centres. And I'll move on now to carry on talking about the methodology. Uh, we had a two-pronged approach, as I mentioned, one targeting the language centres, which you see on the map, and the other uh, targeting linguists who specialise in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, and uh, to collect information from them about uh, languages where there are gaps, that is to say where there's no language centre that uh, can supply information about that language. So there are a number of gaps around Australia, so we reached out to quite a few uh, linguists. Now, uh, the, uh, the survey was tested through a pilot and modified based on the feedback, and we we're very grateful to those who participated in the pilot. And I have to say that gathering information on the status of the more than 250 Australian Indigenous languages is very difficult, but we are pleased that the results of this third NILS uh, were consistent with the findings of our previous surveys. Now, I think I'm not going to have animations now, which is sad with all my work for those, but uh, I'll put up with that. So uh, I'll say something now about the uh, survey questions that were used in NILS. So the survey was designed and deployed to build on the work of the previous uh, surveys and to capture data to be used to assess the state of each language. Now, there were 19 questions in the survey. I won't go through all of them, but there are some key questions that focused on the distribution of generational use of language, Estimations of speaker numbers, which uh, was done in total by age and by proficiency. 
the proportion of people in the group in the language group that speak the language and how and when the language is used. There are also questions about the domains of use, documentation levels and uh, training for Indigenous language workers and so on. Uh, but these four you see in front of you are the, uh, the key questions that really provide the main information we're collecting. Uh, moving on, uh, I'll say something about the format. The, the uh, development, of, development of the survey form drew heavily on our experiences with the previous surveys and was designed to work with participants across the full spectrum of language backgrounds, including those who perhaps don't speak English as their first language, those who speak a Creole or a variety of English as their first language. The survey was made available online, but an offline version was available and it could also be completed uh, by phone. So there are a number of people, who, of groups who took up that opportunity. Participation was of course voluntary and every question except for the consent form and language name were optional. So participants could answer only the questions they felt comfortable an answering. Now the, uh, the data collected was anonymized and then ingested into a database and the results analyzed and used in the production of the NILS 3 section in the uh, NILA, the report. Now, there are a number of uh, issues or complexities that came up in, uh, in, well, that come up each time, in fact, in trying to carry out a survey of this kind. I won't go into detail about many of them, but just a few as examples of the, uh, of the uh, complexities. So one key one is defining a language. So if we're asking people what language they speak, we're assuming that we have the same understanding of what's meant by language. And there are, of course, many cases where we know some re respondents may describe two named varieties as different forms of the same language, whereas other respondents uh, will say they're different languages. So we had to be clear in our communication in the survey about this. We want to count languages, so we have to try and be consistent with our def definitions. But this is difficult, it's, it's quite tricky. Another one is what does it mean to be a speaker of a language? Is it someone who can express anything they want to whatsoever in the language? someone who is able to use some words or somewhere in between. Again, we had to be clear in our communication within the survey so that everyone understood and uh, uh, gave answers that we could knew how to interpret. Finally, the actual assessment of the state of a language. This is again, another complex issue, but involves having, having uh, taken regard of the uh, number of speakers, the transmission to children uh, as two of the most important uh, measures of the uh, state of vitality of a language. Right, I'll just go on to uh, talk about the key findings. So again, my animation isn't working, so you're getting no surprises. I'm afraid they're all there in front of you. So look, uh, our, our key findings began with the fact that NIL3 received 171 responses covering 141 language varieties. So that's a, a good proportion of all of Australia's indigenous languages, given that uh, I think most of us agree that there are more than 250 indigenous Australian languages. Now of those 250, the survey told us that at least 123 languages still have speakers, of which 12 are strong. Now, when we say those 12 are strong, we mean uh, that those are spoken by most members of the community and are being passed on to children as a matter of course. The other languages with speakers that aren't strong vary from having uh, large groups of older speakers to perhaps only one or two very elderly people who can speak them. In addition, there are two new languages that we uh, collected information on in this survey, Creole and Yumpla Talk. These are Creoles, Creole spoken across the top end and Yumpla Talk in the Torres Straits. And these are both strong languages and also are the ones with the largest numbers of speakers, these two new languages. Additionally, at least 30, in fact, uh, probably quite a few more than 30 uh, languages are seeing intense language reawakening activities. That's a very heartening thing to see. But finally, the, the point has to be made that the survey showed clearly that all Indigenous Australian languages are under severe threat. Uh, even, those, even those that we rate as uh, strong, all are under severe threat. And I think that actually calling them strong is not the best term, but uh, it is important to keep in mind they are under threat. NILS 3 shows a steady ongoing decline in both the number of Australian languages with speakers and the number that rate as strong. So I have here a uh, graph that shows the uh, a comparison across NILS 1, NILS 2, and the most recent NILS 3. The, the red column shows the number that are strong, and you can see that that has declined, although uh, slowly, which is not surprising given that, given that these are the strong languages, uh, typically with some thousands of speakers. The blue bar shows the other languages that are not strong but have speakers, 
there has been decline there, but something that we've only started capturing in the second survey and then in this most recent one is reawakening languages. So you can see the green bars there that show that there are languages, substantial numbers of languages being reawakened. Now, the, these are languages that have not had speakers for some time, but communities are now working to bring them back into use. And there is in fact evidence that the uh, number of communities working, uh, working on this activity is growing and is much more than 30. So when you say 30 plus, I, I think it could be quite a lot more than 30, perhaps twice that number. So that's a very good thing to see. Uh, another interesting issue is the newly investigated element of the two new languages, Creole and Yumplatork, uh, which we hadn't collected information on before. So it was, I think it was uh, certainly about time for us to include them in the survey. Finally, I'll talk about some of the policy implications I see as arising out of this. Now, the main policy implications of the, this particular information the NIL, that the NIL survey collected are ones relating pretty directly to work to support Indigenous Australian languages. Now, firstly, uh, as I've said before, I keep emphasising this, all Indigenous Australian languages are under severe threat. Uh, Australia's lang Indigenous languages are in a fragile state. Now, ideally, we would be providing adequate support to the languages with speakers so that those that are strong can stay that way and those that are not strong but do have speakers would be getting stronger. So I think this is an important point and this is really uh, a key area where we should be providing greater support. It's, it is, while it is a great result to see the expansion of the vitally important work to reawaken languages, which you'll hear later about the profound uh, importance of that to their communities, this, this is work that's necessary where languages have lost all speakers and so require reawakening. And it's this loss that we should be working to reduce or avoid. But it's clear that this is not happening enough as, these, as languages with speakers continue to decline and move into the state where language reawakening becomes crucial. Uh, as I said there, language reawakening, while vitally important, is a last ditch measure. Ideally, we would be preventing languages from reaching that state in the first place. Finally, I think it's clear that uh, from this that policymakers and service deliverers should be engaging actively with Indigenous Australians to ensure that activities, uh, in order to ensure that their activities uh, support Indigenous lang Australian languages and don't add to the uh, decline of these languages. So I think that's something to keep in mind for any kind of uh, policy or uh, service delivery that engages with, with Indigenous Australia. And look, I'd, uh, I'll stop there because time is short, but I did want to acknowledge uh, some people who participated in the uh, survey as our uh, as a uh, committee to give us guidance. That's Faith Based and Julie Briggs, Coco Yu, Emily, and Karina Lester. They were closely involved in the design of the project and the survey. So thanks to them. So look, I think now uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Is that right, Carmel? Uh, not exactly, Doug. We'll have the questions uh, after we've had the next couple of presentations. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I hope that was of interest. Thank you.